Hey, it's Laura. If you're listening to this, you're not hearing the complete unedited version of this conversation. If you want in on that, you can get it by becoming a TMST Plus member. Just head over to our website at tmstpod.com and click support. All right, enjoy the show. Hey, Laura here. So I stumbled upon today's guests in 2008 or so when someone sent me a song called I Don't Feel Young. I played that track over and over and over. I guess I didn't feel young at the time, and I fell in love with the female vocalist's atmospheric voice and the haunting lyrics. Jen Wasner is one half of Y Oak, the band that recorded I Don't Feel Young, and so many other songs that colored those early years of becoming a mother and then eventually coming to terms with my drinking. She's also been part of some of my other favorites, like Bonnie Iver and Sylvan Esso, and she has a solo project called Flock of Dimes that just released a new collection of songs that I think are her best yet. Jen is, as they say, a musician's musician, and I am so excited to bring you this conversation. Although I was very acquainted with her music, I really didn't know a lot about her as a person until I started prepping for the show. I figured out pretty quickly how much we have in common, that we both struggle with slowing down and resting into the concept of enough, that we both tend towards workaholism, and that we wear many different hats and how that can fracture our perception of ourselves as real artists, and that we both struggle mightily with the performative nature of today's culture, especially on social media. I'm not going to lie, I was definitely a bit intimidated going into this one. It's the first musician we've had on the show, and as a music lover, I hold musicians in this sort of godly, way cooler than me light. But we fell right in. And I'm so excited for you to meet Jen, and then check out both her music and the amazing playlist she assembled for this episode. You can find the link to that playlist and all the other ones we've created for each episode on our show website at tmstpod.com. Enjoy. So, hey, Jen, so good to have you and to meet you. We've never even emailed or talked on Instagram or anything. A cold podcast. A cold podcast. It's always really cool when I when I hear that someone's a fan and not just my friend. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was tracing it back and re-listening to old Y Oak stuff. I found Y Oak in 2007, which was like a Ooh. music. This is the time when I found all this music. It was like, I just remember that year so well. And I was also newly married and kind of disillusioned about that and just going through a really weird, heavy time in my life. And I remember I was working at this ad agency at the time and just listening to If Children over and over and over and over and over again. I have this. So you actually go way back. Wow. I'm usually people say like 2012 or 2014, but like that's, that's the earliest it goes really. I have this memory of sitting in at my desk at the agency and um, there was a video of you (laughs) singing I Don't Feel Young in the back of a Yaris. (laughs) I remember. (laughs) Yeah. I went to look for it and it's down. Thank God. I don't need to be shilling for Toyota for the rest of my life. You two were like crammed in the back. It must, I think it was in at South by Southwest or something. Oh, it was very much at South by Southwest. Oh, okay. (laughs) You're like, yes, I remember. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You were crammed into the back of this tiny Yaris singing that and I, it was, I don't know, I loved it so much. I, I think I watched that like 600 times. But anyway, that song in particular I listened to this morning, it was like, oh my God. I just remember just being in that space that I was in, whole different life. Young. 
That's so wonderful to hear. It, it's so interesting because I feel like being a songwriter in particular, it sort of forces you to contend with all of these previous versions of yourself. And that, you know, 2007, I mean, God, like, who was that? You know, like, who was that lady? But at the same time, she lived, she, she did what she did. And like, she, I guess, like reached people. I think I'm getting to a point in my life where I'm able to, through my own shame and embarrassment enough to be able to look back on those things with love and compassion rather than just like, oh God, look at what I was wearing or like, that's, you know, I wouldn't write that song now or whatever it is. Um, so that's all to say, thank you. And I'm, I'm really glad I was, you know, you always wonder who's going to watch this. And like, now I know. <laughs> now, you know, it was some 29 year old <laughs> in Boston whose heart was like breaking in a thousand ways mm -hmm. and totally different life. That's when I was still drinky. I was like, that's when my drinking really picked up before I got sober and just, oh my God. So yeah, I want to talk a lot about what you just said, sort of the looking back, because you've written about that recently, you know, re-releasing Civilian and uh, just your work on sort of self-forgiveness. But I have a different way I want to go in, because like everyone else, 2020 was not what we expected, but I think you had a particularly stark plan versus reality. Can you talk about that as the way in? Of course. So I'm a touring musician, obviously. I've been touring for the better part of every year for over a decade. It's something that has become baked into the fabric of my existence. I know no other way. And 2020 was poised to be no exception to that. I was working as much as I always did, which was too much. And a relationship had ended. I was embarking upon a new relationship that would later end during the pandemic. And I saw, you know, kind of right at the same time as all of these personal things were happening, my entire professional life, which also encompasses my whole identity and everything that I do and everything mm -hmm. that I am, kind of just went away overnight. And I found myself here in North Carolina where I live um, at home alone. And I didn't have any of the coping mechanisms that I would typically use. I couldn't go and over socialize and be around people all the time. I couldn't go on tour. I couldn't work. The only thing that I could really do was write and, mm -hmm. you know, cry. <laughs> I think what that, what that moment ended up becoming for me, even though I rejected it, I think with everything that I had, I was, I was, I resisted the direction yep. that my life was going. But what I think I realized and what, I'm, what I think is an incredible lesson that I'm still sort of trying to, to hold on to now as the world is, quote unquote, opening back up, is that so much of my anxiety, like my attempts to manage my own anxiety, hinged upon this, this illusion of control. So like controlling my environment, controlling my schedule, like controlling down to minute, like what I'm doing with every day, when I lost that control or when that control, that illusion of control, which I guess I really never had in the first place, was taken away from me, I was left to sort of learn how to manage that anxiety in a way that I think is actually a little bit more authentic. Because the reality is, is that there was never any control to begin with. And it was working for me for such a long time that I thought that I had it, right? Like I really thought that I was that I had everything just the way it needed to be and I was in the driver's seat and it was all just going to go exactly according to plan. And of course it did not for anyone and it did not on a number of levels for me go according to plan. Um, so kind of contending with that. I mean, heartbroken, trying to work my way through that grief and to the actual fundamental underlying grief, which is of course way deeper and goes way further back, which is like a whole other story. Yep. And yeah, I mean, I guess sort of trying to come back out the other side with some sense that, that I can live something resembling the life I used to live, but s embrace the discomfort of not knowing and not being in control, which is to be honest, at this very moment, quite overwhelming. <laughs> um, yeah. I feel all of that so much. When you were forced to slow down and you, you weren't in constant motion, which is mm -hmm. one of my favorite coping mechanisms, you, you know, noticed yourself 
making a meal for you know cooking a meal and sort of these boring moments of life where you realized you weren't performing life you were just living your life and how wonderful those moments are but how odd they are too because you don't have an audience how you reconcile those two parts of you like you need the performer and ostensibly we also need to perform as artists i'm a writer you're a musician you have to perform outwardly to some degree to promote your work and all that everywhere everyone whether you're artists or not there's this performative element that seems to be overshadowing just the living element but then you, when you taste the living element, it's like, oh, right, I'm a living person. And these parts of my life, this is where I, I feel like myself. And I, it was like a returning in a way. I don't even know what the question is, but can you talk about that? Oh, but I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think that it all comes back to me because this is something I think about constantly. Mm -hmm. The constant need to be witnessed in all things scares me. That's seeking a validation that we all have to varying degrees, whether it's in our, you know, one-on-one -on -one daily lives or in our social circles, or if you're, you know, a public figure, someone who does have a more public way of making a living, like for an audience, yeah. that need to be witnessed in everything feels really uncomfortable to me because there's so many parts of my life that I don't want to be witnessed or I want to be the sole witness. I want to protect some sense of what is mine and what is f for consumption outside of me. But what's really uncomfortable about that for me right now, and I think probably for a lot of people, is that more and more people, even people who don't necessarily rely on social media for their job, are being sort of conditioned to share every moment of their waking lives. And, and I think it, it kind of reinforces this need to be witnessed at all times and all things by another person, which I think alienates us from ourselves. You know, you mentioned that feeling of like kind of being in my life and being my sole witness as a returning, but to be honest with you, I'm not even sure that I ever knew what it was mm. to be with myself or mm. who I was. You know, I grew up in an environment with addiction and a lot of codependency and a lot of like really intense, heightened emotional caretaking for me as, you know, as a young kid. And I think I learned how to focus on trying to control my environment and be safe through managing people and getting the validation of the other people. And, you know, of course I can sit here and attempt to psychoanalyze myself all day and be like, and that's why I'm an artist. And like, you know, uh, of course it is. And also maybe it isn't. I think that I had gone on so long in that mindset of like, if someone doesn't see what I'm doing or what I'm making or just something as simple as, you know, I did this, I did that. I went to the store, you know, like even in relationships, it's like, um, the yeah. need to share with your friends or your partner, like, I'm doing this now, I'm doing this now, I'm doing this now. And like part of that is like a really nice way of feeling connected to other people. But but there's like there's like a line where it com becomes about like not being able to do anything without external validation, without being witnessed in like everything that you're doing. So for me, it's like, how do I, when I know that that's actually not healthy for me and like for someone who considers herself to be like, in recovery from codependency in many ways. Like, how do I engage with the hecka toxic music industry <laughs> yeah. and everything that it asks, which is to be constantly visible, to constantly compete for like everyone's attention at all times and still be a happy, healthy, like centered person and still feel like I, I can be like centered within myself. And to be honest, I don't have an answer to that question. It's really hard. And a lot of the time I, when I really like rub up against it in a way that feels uncomfortable, my brain is immediately just like run away, like quit, go hide, which I don't want to do because mm -hmm. this is my only skill and it's the thing I love more than anything in the world. So yeah, I don't know. I haven't really figured it out yet either, Ugh. but I think about it a lot. <laughs> I think about it all the time, all the time. 
Because it's a paradox. Why I read is to to connect to someone's experience, whether it's fictional or to, you know, it's to see something in myself or to learn something that I recognize in myself or to share an experience that someone has written down, whether it's real or not. And so the sharing element is part of art and creating and, and yes, part of relationships, but I don't know, man. I recently, I've had this like very dramatic relationship with social media for that reason, because I was someone who had an entirely different career and the, I was not a public person online. And then in, when I got sober, I started writing and all that, and it really shifted. And I've relied a lot on my sharing of my life on social media to have a platform in order to be successful as a writer. And then there's this weird thing where you feel like your entire life becomes potential content. And so there's like a third person, a third entity in your life all the time going, should I share this? Is this material? I think for me, my resistance to it is is partially stubbornness and, and just sort of like me wanting to put my foot down and be like, I don't want to do it. Like, I don't want to change. Like, I don't want to put on a show for these people. And it's partially embarrassment. But I also think one of the things that I've been trying to push myself on with it lately has to do with the concept that I've been thinking about of usually the thing we judge most harshly in other people is the thing you know, we fear or judge the most harshly in ourselves. And so I think when I see myself looking at someone who's like mm -hmm. really doing a great job of like putting together a really well curated social media existence and like really just like nailing it. And I, I feel resentment like every time. It doesn't matter even if it's a person that I know and love. Like my reaction to that is kind of like an ew gross, like no matter who you are, which is I don't think that's how I really feel or how I really want to feel. I think it has to do with my own shame around the fact that I'm, I struggle with it and I'm not good at it. And so I do think that there is a part of me that's like, like I, I don't think that it's good and I think that it's like breaking our brains and I think it's part of the reason why our society is so uh, incredibly fractured and why communication has become so difficult. Yeah, I, I feel that. And I think where it gets scary is when you really don't know the difference between when you're performing and when you're not. Can you just experience a moment on your own and have that be enough? Is If, if you can't, that's, that's a scary place to be. Do you have either friends in the industry or teachers or you know mentors that have helped you get the right perspective around what constitutes success for you when you when you spin out do you spin out oh i spin out i mean i spin out on the regular for sure i mean how <laughs> what could does you spinning not? out look like like what are the thoughts um spinning out looks like for me i mean it looks like a number there's a couple different ways it can go there's like the creative spinning out of just like oh, you're a hack and you've compromised everything you believe in to participate in this industry that is inherently like evil and capitalistic and racist and bad and like you're bad as a result and the only good, morally good thing to do would be to quit. But then what are you going to do for money? You don't have any other skills. You have no job experience. You dropped out of college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's like one form of spinning out. That's a that's a decent spin out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like the other form is I think a sort of more like pure kind of less careerist version of that where it's just sort of like I'll never write a song again and all the songs I've ever written aren't even really very good and I'll never be as good as Joni Mitchell or like whatever it is. You know, like <laughs> that's sort of more like the Eeyore version that like woe is me. Like until you write a song, you truly believe in your heart of hearts, you ne you'll never write another thing again. Uh, until you die and then it happens and you're like oh that happened but again no control no control to think the thing that I do that I've done my whole life that I love so much that I've worked so hard to get good at and I still have no control over whether I can do it when it happens how it happens it's crazy but yeah those are my two forms of spinning out it happens a lot uh, I find that more so ev with every passing year the way that I want to exist and that like how I want to sort of like walk that line between art and commerce becomes more and more difficult mm. to hold mm. because I don't, I don't consider myself to be an entertainer 
naturally. And I don't want all the attention and I don't want all of the money. What I want is a sustainable life. And what I want is for the things that I make to feel as though they are authentic and that they are reaching the people they are meant to reach and that they are in -hmm. some way bettering the quality of someone's life somewhere. I often think if I wasn't, if I was, if I didn't have any musical ability, what would I have done with my life? And I, I often come back to like, I'd probably be like a therapist or some sort of like healer. <laughs> I knew you were going to yeah, say like that. Yeah, like kind of yeah. healing practice because I really do feel like that is the number one motivation behind the music that I make. It's, it's healing for me, mm-hmm. but it's important that I offer it up to others to like complete the circle of like, you know, why am I here? I do feel really lucky. I have a lot of really wonderful, um, brilliant, supportive and thoughtful friends. I mean, even just the other day, I was spitting out pretty hard. Um, and I had a chat with my friend Meg Duffy, who makes yeah. music under the name Hen Habits. And they're amazing. They're such an incredible person and brilliant. And, and you know, we had the same conversation of like around what does success look like? And I was kind of on this tip of like, I, I'm going to become gradually, increasingly more and more irrelevant and fewer and fewer people are going to care about what I do and I'm not going to be able to make a living and then I'll just die. <laughs> and, you know, just being able to say those thoughts out loud yeah. is really helpful. And, and you know, Meg and I talked about how crazy it is that, um, you know, we are among some of the luckiest people on earth when it comes to the opportunities that have been presented to us to like share our music with the world. And it's still really hard, you know, like I'm still fighting for a way to figure out how to book a tour that isn't going to lose thousands of dollars. I want a tour. I want to go out into the world, you know, I want to bring my band to all the cities and play for all the people who want to see me. You start crunching the numbers and it's just like, shit's expensive, man. And it's like, so it's frustrating to be like, I'm so lucky. I have I have so many advantages and privileges that so many people do not have. And this still sometimes feels unsustainable or like it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. It's not going to fly. And I've managed to kind of like make it work for the past 15 years. So when it's like, well, if it's worked so far, you kind of have to like take a deep breath and have faith that you'll be able to keep going. But it doesn't always feel there are days when it feels less possible than other days. <laughs> Well, it's, that's back to the, self, the control thing. We started this conversation with me talking about your music in 2007, which was 14 years ago. And I can listen to it. I can say now that listening to I Don't Feel Young, that whole album of children, like that got me through. You did what you wanted to do. You did what you set out to do. So I'm wondering if it's a matter of, because I know this is true for me, just not being able to really feel that, no matter how many people tell you that, because I'm sure there have been hundreds, if not thousands, over the course of your career, Mm -hmm. just not being able to feel that and letting that reach you. You you feel the the despair or the negativity <clears throat> or the negative feedback so much more. Oh, yeah. No, that's huge. I mean, I think um, that's part of what about this past year has been so transformative for me mm. is that I think this is the first time with this record that I made, um, which is called Head of Roses. What makes it different is exactly what you're talking about of like, being able to feel into my body the first time. You know, I, I, I spent a lot of time this year trying to learn about how the body carries trauma and processes it. And, mm. you know, understanding that this, this numbness that I have is a protective impulse that I developed pretty young to, to shield my sweet, sensitive heart from pain. And I never realized that it that it was there, or that I was that that I was disconnected from the way that I was feeling, because it was it was working. You know, I was like functioning. I was very high functioning, and I was I was moving through the world, and I was, you know, doing the work that I had to do. I think in many ways my workaholism was a distraction from the possibility that I could feel my feelings. But then you know this year hit, and I couldn't I couldn't resist. Um, it was there's there was there were no distractions in that experience anymore. I definitely agree with you that um, 
yes, re- reissuing Civilian. And I, I'm thinking a lot about that time of my life. And in many ways, that was like a real peak. That was a peak of our career, mm. you know, with me and my bandman Aunt Andy and Y Oak. That was like the moment where we were, things were getting kind of zeitgeisty and we were like getting a lot of feedback and popping up in a lot of places. And like, and I was miserable and I didn't care. I didn't feel any of it. That was probably <laughs> the saddest I've ever been and healthiest I've ever been. What a gift to get the thing you wanted and realize that it's not it. Oh, you know what an incredible right? gift to be like. Well, what now? Because some people don't get the you know they don't they're just constantly thinking that they can reach that place instead of going where you need to go, which is like in here. Listener, I'm pointing to my heart. In here, you know, it's 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 inside. Yeah, but until you experience that, it's just words. Like, I think it was Jim Carrey, I brought this up before, who said, I hope my wish is that for everyone is that they get everything they wanted so they realize that's not going to make them happy. It's not where it where it's at. Right there. There is no it. There is no it. I love that quote. Yeah. And man, did I learn that lesson this year. And it has been. I mean, of course, it's been a very, very difficult and very, very painful year and a half at this point. And for so many people, to varying degrees, so much worse than what I've what I've dealt with. Um, I've led a very privileged pandemic existence in a number of ways. But, you know, everyone's dealing with this collective trauma and fear and grief. It's been hard. But... To have everything that I thought was the, you know, the framework of my satisfaction and happiness kind of collapse and like have the rug completely pulled out from under me and to think, oh, well, I I guess this means I'll be miserable now forever. And then to have slowly a completely different experience than the experience that I was expecting to have where I just kind of revealed layer after layer of of myself to myself. How did you do that? What what happened? Like, t- like slow it down a little bit because I feel like this is really important because you were going to go on tour, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was supposed to go on tour with all of the bands that I toured with. I was supposed to tour with Y Oak. I was supposed to tour with Bonnie Vare. I was, you know, I had a whole year. That's the the nature of my work is that it's pretty diverse. Like I work for a lot of different people and I also make my own music. I mean, it happened very slowly because for months I was just miserable and it was woe was me and my life is over. And Like at the beginning of 2020? 
Yeah, like uh, you know, March when through hit, yeah. June. I mean, I'm a big creature of routine. I didn't stop making my to-do list. I, I and I still do this. I, I make a daily to-do list, and even if the things on the to-do list are like wake up, meditate, eat lunch, you know, even if it doesn't necessarily need to be written down and checked off, like it, the sense of structure feels really uh, important to to me so I Mm -hmm. you know I made a schedule it it usually involved yeah like I I had a meditation practice and a yoga practice exercise is really important to me yoga in particular because um I have a really amazing uh yoga teacher who I adore who um has given me an incredible gift of understanding yoga to be a practice that is not aspirational and not about exercise but is more about like the spiritual experience of like feeling pleasure in your body. I usually would take a really long walk. I spent a lot of time alone. I journaled. I read a lot. And I played music. Another thing that I did a lot of this year was I, you know, I feel like the workaholic part of my brain was like, this is your opportunity to get better at guitar. It's your opportunity to get better at all the things people pay you to do. But I didn't do that. I spent hours and hours and hours playing the drums a thing that no one pays me to do and no one will ever get me to do but brings me so much joy and like it's so physical you know it's like a full body experience to to lose yourself in that you know to turn your brain off so that you're just kind of using all your limbs you know so I just kind of like I learned to give myself things that felt good and not feel guilty about it um yeah and I and in doing that, I learned what felt good, which is just sort of like, okay, what do right. you like? What do you like other than like trying to micromanage other people's emotional experience? <laughs> <laughs> what are your hobbies and interests? <laughs> what do you I guess do I gotta besides get some. emotional yeah. manipulation? Yeah. <laughs> do you, wait, yeah. As you're talking, I'm like, this is what it's like to get sober. Yeah. This is what it's like. And, and I yeah. joked at the beginning of the pandemic, I'm like, oh, my God, it's like everyone's in a meeting now. OK, yes. so so yes. I get it. You you kind of dropped dropped into your body in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. And and my body sort of started to learn that it was safe mm. to feel often. You know, I think when when trauma is ongoing, you know, your body never like lets its guard down enough to to actually feel your feelings. And for a while, like I would. You know, I'd be going about my business and then it would be time to do my meditation practice and I'd sit down and I'd start breathing and then within 30 seconds mm-hmm. I'd be crying. You know, and I couldn't have necessarily gotten there just by going about my day. I would have just been, I would have been in my head and not in my body. But, you know, that had happened for many, many days in a row. And yeah, and it's, it's, this is the thing that's tricky too is that like I had the luxury and the immense privilege of so much time which is a gift that, like, not a lot of people have access to. Or not a lot of people choose either. You know, they, they, they wouldn't choose it even if they had it, right? Choosing it is one thing, but, like, it's just a privilege thing. Like, a lot yeah. of people just, they have to work. They have to be out yep. in the world. Um, it's, a different, it's a different scenario. And I, I do work, but fortunately I had managed to kind of recalibrate much of my work to be from home. And also I had some savings, so I was able to get through it. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm the executive producer of the podcast. At TMST, we're passionate about having conversations that bring us together and help us stoke our love of life. That's why we created a dedicated site for the show. It's free. It's not a Facebook group, and we aren't mining your data to target you with ads. So check it out. And while you're there, please join TMST Plus, our paid membership group. TMST Plus members will play the critical role in keeping this going and ad-free. There are no corporations backing us. There's no advertisers. I mean, it's really up to us to pull together and make it happen. You can make a one-time contribution, or you can join our monthly program, where you can help shape the show, hear the complete unedited interviews, and join regular online experiences with Laura. But know this, you can make a huge difference right now. 
for as little as $10 a month. You can find the link in the show description. And then please head over to tmstpod.com right now and join us. I want to just turn a little bit so we can get to um, some of the specific things that you've written about and this new album. You weren't planning on creating this album in 2020, and and you did. I think a way into this conversation is to just talk about two songs that I'm curious about and its specific lines in them. You did two songs that you've released anyway from live from Betty's. What is Betty's? Betty's is is my home it is paradise. Um, it is. So my friends, Nick and Amelia have a band called Sylvanesso and they started a recording studio and sort of community space, um, that's in the woods, uh, just a little bit away from where I live in North Carolina. And it's a beautiful space and it feels so open and peaceful and contained during the pandemic. I went there Wow. Pretty much every day. We had a daily outdoor, let's not go and lose yeah. our minds kind of happy hour called wine time that where we would sit on the porch and drink wine and look at the trees and sort of be in the presence of other people. And so that space in many ways has come to feel like more like home yeah. to me than almost any other place. Oh, what a gift. And Betty's, what's the deal, deal with the name? Um, Betty uh, was Nick's grandma. Oh, okay. I love it. Yeah. Shout out so, to Betty. So... You shout out to Betty. We love Betty. There's two songs that you released live at Betty's from the fl- recent Flock of Dimes album that you did, Head of Roses. And two, the two songs, well, the first one I want to ask you about is One More Hour, which is stunning, by the way. Thank you. I've listened to it like 12 times in the last 24 hours. Thank you so much. It's gorgeous. I could do anything, but I wonder in the world can I forgive myself? For I'm back into it, and I'm praying it's time tonight. I know there's nothing for it if I could have it. The part of the song is, and I could do anything, but I wander in the world of you. Can I forgive myself for falling back into it? I'm paying attention now. I know there's nothing for it. If I could have anything, I'd take one more hour. Yeah, that about says it, huh? Dude. (laughs) What? Yeah. I don't know. That about says it. What is this? What is behind this song? I mean, it's sort of a, it's a double edged, uh, sadness sword um <laughs> part of it is yeah. part of it is mourning the loss of the world and part mm-hmm. of it is mourning the loss of a specific person but in both cases it is about the projection of fantasy of longing that was preventing me at the time from being present in my life and yeah. i do think that having those moments of grief are really really important not just for people, yeah. but for like ev- for all of it. You know, I was mourning. It felt like at the time that I was mourning everything at once, and it, and in many ways I kind of was. And so it was just a it was a song of like yeah of grief of like letting go of mourning of missing of longing, and it was in many ways about a specific person. But I think in in large part it was also about the world itself, my life, the people yeah. I loved, the things I loved to do, all of it. You know, and just thinking about the things that I took for granted. And like, I think there's also a line where like, um, the first chance I get, I'll be running, you know, like it's so easy to sit in your house and be mm-hmm. like, Oh man, like I'll, you know, next time when it's, when it's 
you know, like we all did, like, man, when I can go out to eat again or when I can go to the movies again, just you wait. And it's like now we sort of can or maybe, maybe not. But like I almost kind of don't even want to. It's so confusing. <laughs> it's so I weird. Know. It's mm. so weird that push pull yeah. of like there is no going back to normal that that's mm. gone. And I've been working from home for a long time and I I will. I liked a lot of the slowness of it. Again, very lucky, very privileged mm-hmm. situation in the pandemic, mm-hmm. not being a frontline worker. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the one line that I want to ask about, because you talk a lot about forgiving yourself in other places recently, and including a post that you wrote, or a piece that you wrote mm-hmm. called Don't Read This, about re-releasing civilian. So you said, for, uh, can I forgive myself for falling back into it? So what, what is that? What's the forgiveness about there? I mean, I don't think anyone's ever shamed oneself into growth. <laughs> Correct. You know, I think shame keeps us stationary. It keeps us limited. And I think that real growth comes through accepting all the parts of yourself, even the ones you don't you might not love that much um and looking at them with compassion and understanding mm. why they're there and that where they came from you know and i i am a person who i held myself to an unspeakably unreachably high standard of perfection of optimization nothing was ever enough i wasn't ever working out enough i wasn't ever writing enough songs i wasn't ever you know any moment that i wasn't capitalizing on the potential of Mm. was a moment I felt guilt yeah it's dark and I think a lot of people live their lives that way because that's it's partially conditioning and partially just a reaction to um how difficult it is to be a person in the world you know I think a lot of this the sort of like self-love self-acceptance stuff that you start like you know you on faith you're like I think this is something I need to work on but when you first dip your toes into it. It feels mm-hmm. kind of silly. It feels uncomfortable. It doesn't quite fit. But it's one of those things that I think um, I've grown into and it feels real to me now. And, and I understand it in a way that I didn't before. And it's like you said earlier in this conversation where you're like, those are just words to someone yeah. until they experience it for themselves. It's tough because, you know, you you go through an experience like that and you want to try and share it with people. But there's just nothing you can really do like people have to kind of come to it. They have to feel into it in their own time. I think the best thing you can do is write a song like that. Or I tried to, to write about what I've learned about that and it reaches someone at the right time where it, they experience it. They have a moment of experiencing, not, not just thinking about it or hearing the words and they can experience Mm -hmm. that little bit of grace within themselves that right and you also have to reach a point where it's just not going to work for you anymore to beat the shit out of yourself you know it you have to just hit you have to really hit the wall with that because it'll carry you a long way well and it can't be conditional yeah it can't be conditional like I think that was me it was like oh well I'll love myself just as soon as I am (laughs) x or you know like just as soon as I do this or just as soon as I look like this or you know then I will absolutely love and accept myself yes it never ends. That's that's a dead end. You know, it can't be conditional. I am not a perfect person. I make mistakes. I hurt people without meaning to. You know, I have to love myself as the imperfect, flawed person that I am right now and let, in the way that I, I have to give myself the same grace that I give, I try to give the people I love. Right. You know, I try and talk to myself the way that I talk to my friends and people I care about. There's a great Guardian article about you, profiling oh, yes. you, and it was really thoughtful and detailed and layered and I will link it up in the show notes so everyone can get it but you said that you had long confused self-compassion with self-optimization yep that's it (laughs) that's it yeah Yeah. it was like yeah it was like self-love meant to me it meant like I'll exercise seven days a week you know not like do you want to do this does this feel good in your body do you have the energy like can you be okay if you don't, or are you just going to shame yourself? 
I had it backwards. I had it all backwards <laughs> for a really long time. And that's the thing. You, you, we have to have it backwards. Mm-hmm. We have to get lost yeah. and then yeah. and so lost yeah. that it doesn't work for us anymore. It, it sounds to me, I don't know how old you are. I think you're in your 30s, yeah? I'm 35. Yeah. I mean, I think you're right on time. I'm going to be 44 this month. And I, it's, I'm, I think this is one of the extraordinarily beautiful things about what can come with age is this, this running out of our self-defense mechanisms, which we beat the shit out of ourselves mm-hmm. for, and also carry us a long way, running out of those, those, this sort of container empties finally, and you're forced to find another yeah. way. And it's terrible news at first. It's terrible news. Yep. It's, there's no way that it's not going to be excruciatingly painful. Right. <laughs> That's right. I want to be good. I want to put your hands over my dark eyes and finally see it. My spirit is dragging. It's been sweeping enough. I remember what it feels like when it's all bad. Wanna wake it up. The other track that you released from Live at Betty's is Two, called Two, and mm. it starts with, I want to be good and I want to mean it, <laughs> yeah. which I, I stopped yep. the song right there, which is like 10 seconds into the song. I'm like, ah, oh, okay, I have to ask her about that. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I feel like so few people actually pay attention to the lyrics oh, and I put no. so much work into them. <laughs> No, that's why I loved I Don't Feel Young, because it's really actually almost a little bit hard to hear all the lyrics in that song because of the way that you arrange the song. And and that's part of what makes it so atmospheric and beautiful. But you have to really listen. And this this the song the lyrics in that song are just it makes me cry when I think of it because they're they're gorgeous. They're stunning to some, you know, as a writer, I just I'm in it for the words. So I want to be good and I want to and I want to mean it. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that there's this obsession for me. There has been this obsession with being seen as good. Uh, And that is not. Man, I'm going to just go ahead and get real culty on you. So my friends and I are into this um, this sort of uh, personality. Uh, I don't even know how to describe it. It's called the Enneagram. Oh my um, God! You don't know. I know this. I have got years and years. Okay, what are okay. you? Let's t- let's go. Oh, well, you want to take a guess? Uh, you want to maybe <laughs> look to the title of the title of the song? You just <laughs> you're a f- oh, you are a two. Okay, okay. okay. I am a two. Yeah. Oh, I actually have God a running joke. You. I have a running joke with my friends, my who I talk about the enneagram with. That um, when you look at my record, it's just twos, 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 twos everywhere, and and then like the, the <laughs> yeah. like the chorus of that song, you know, to be like, was what any what enneagram type are you? Two. I don't um, think the enneagram is culty. I, I some people do, but be... I don't even love it. I think it's an incredible framework. Um, it's an incredible. It's old. It's an ancient spiritual framework. Yes, like it dates back, and it's and it's also for the you know people who are scientific and math- mathematical. Nine is this extraordinarily meaningful number in mathematics and you um, know you know so wait what are, what are you will you share your type with me yeah i'm a seven. Oh, you're a seven mm-hmm. ah i have a really good friend one of my good friends in my group is a seven yeah a yeah seven. i'm a seven a, a mm-hmm. very 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 seven i've been into this for a while and my friends are all into it with me and it's been really helpful yeah. honestly and i'm a two and you know, the like sort of reductive title is helper. So it's a lot about mm-hmm. giving and helping and caretaking. Um, and I, but goodness, right? Getting back to goodness. I, I think it, yes. you know, the, the vice of the two is pride. And and twos want to be seen as good. They want to be seen. Mm-hmm. It's almost like the perception of goodness is as important as the, the actual goodness itself. 
And I remember listening to one of the guys, you know, who I like a lot. His name is Russ Hudson. He has a really good audio uh, book. About... Yep. I've met Russ. I've hung out with him many times. I am so starstruck. I listened to his most recent audio book. And in the chapter about twos, he says, there's nothing angelic about pretending to be an angel. And so much of the growth path is, for me, I think is about like accepting that I'm flawed and accepting my humanity and, and letting other people see it. You know, letting yeah. people see my humanity, parts of myself that aren't just not trying to paint this picture of this like perfect, good, altruistic, completely unselfish human being, which is really just a form of manipulation at the heart of it, right? Like that's the thing about the Enneagram that gets you. It's just like, you're like, oh no, they see my bullshit. That's my bullshit. You know, yep. you're doing it even though you don't want to admit to yourself that you're doing it. And so a big part of... I think, you know, that going back to what you originally asked, you know, I want to be good. I want to be seen as good. Yeah. I want everyone to think that I'm good. I don't want to be flawed. I don't, I don't want to be imperfect. I don't want to let the cracks in the armor show. I want to actually, like, believe in the things that I say rather than yeah. just say them because I think that they're what people want to hear from me, which is people pleasing, which is, you know, another form of emotional manipulation. So well, all you had to do, I, the full explanation was that's coming from the lens of an Enneagram too. And it's like, got it. Yep. I want to be good and I want to mean it. This is great because I was really, usually I have to sort of be careful about how I talk about this. I think some people will really reject the idea of being reduced to a type, but I feel of like course. the Enneagram is extremely expansive once you dig into it. But but like people will either warm up to it or not, depending on how you present it. And no one likes yeah. being told how they are, right? No, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. It, like anything, we, if you go on Instagram and you search Enneagram, it, it's awful because it's all pretty reductive. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not useful. I found it helpful, the most helpful in understanding relationships with other people, like mm -hmm. my boyfriend, mm -hmm. like my friends, like my child, my child. And it's fair that some people reject it. But I think any framework that for me, it helped me have more compassion for myself and the what motivates me, why I do what the shit that I do. And it, yeah, absolutely. it all comes and for others and others and others. And it all comes from this beautiful place of just needing to get needs met and needing to, yeah, to be okay however you survive to make things okay for you yeah whatever whatever you need yeah however you needed to get through the world whatever you developed to protect yourself right and, i mean i think one of the best things that i've learned from the enneagram is that the same action from a different person means a different thing Very. than it would mean it if it were you you know and people are projecting meaning and telling themselves stories about people's behavior based on what it would mean if it were them. But it doesn't mean that because people are different. And I think just even such a simple premise as that has helped me move through the world, not making assumptions and telling stories about people's behavior based on just assuming that everyone thinks and feels exactly the way that I do. Right. And that if they just got it, that they would, yeah. you know. And yeah, yeah it may, it depersonalizes things, which does decrease suffering, can decrease suffering significantly. It can. it can decrease suffering. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's like, it's a framework. It's either for you or it's not. I think people get caught up on, um, like with stuff like this or like with astrology, or like they get really caught up on like whether it's like real. <laughs> and for me, I'm just like, well, if I'm learning something about myself, and others, I don't really give a shit if it's like, what does that even mean? Like, right. if it's a, if it's giving me a context in which to like better understand myself in the world, then it's real enough for yours truly. Like, yeah. that's what I need it for. I agree. It's like archetypes. You know, you can argue whether archetypes are real. Uh, could they be scientifically proven? No. We understand ourselves through story. And in story, there are archetypes. But what else is a song other than a story that we tell ourselves to better understand ourselves? Yeah, I mean, it's like, that's all I do. That's all I do. It's yeah. all I care about. It's just different different versions of that practice of like telling yourself, like unpacking the stories that we tell ourselves about how we are and how we move through the world and how we relate to each other. And that's why I love music. It can be so singular in the way that I listened to the songs this morning and I was 
in 2007 as that version of me mm-hmm. and it brings there's yeah. so few things that can do that I mean I think music is magic because it can be both because you know you can express yourself with words but you can also use the power of sound to reach someone to like circumvent people's defenses and like reach yes. them like hit them where the healing it needs to be it's like definite emotional sorcery the kind of music that i make at least this has been so great it's different to go in totally cold not having any real interaction with someone and i loved every cool. second of it i just related a lot so it made me very excited to talk to you and it didn't disappoint it's been a real treat like i said i was very honored and touched that you reached out i think what is most exciting about having a career in music is not necessarily trying to get as many new fans as possible, but like keeping the ones I have. (laughs) And so when I feel like I'm doing that, like when I'm like, oh, the people who are also very loyal and and are here for the things that I have to offer. And that means I can't even begin to say how much that means to me. I don't know what I'd be doing if that wasn't the case. So thank you for being one of those people. Thank you for hanging out with us today. We want every episode of Tell Me Something True to give you something you can use in your life. We also don't want there to be any barriers between us. That's why we built our own online community. It's free, it's not Facebook. And you can head on over to tmstpod.com to connect with folks around this episode. Also, have you noticed there aren't any ads on TMST? That's by design. We want to keep the show and our digital spaces ad-free, but that's a goal we can only accomplish if we work together. And that's where you can make a huge difference. TMST is being built as an ad-free, subscriber-driven project. The subscribing members will play the critical role in keeping this going and keeping it ad-free. There are no corporations backing us, no sponsors, so it's really up to us. And the good news is, folks are signing up. Thank you so much to all of you who have come on board for this very unusual way to do things. You can join them when you make a one-time contribution or join our monthly program. We have cool opportunities for you to help shape the show, hear the complete unedited interviews, ask our guests questions before they're on, and connect with other TMST folks. I cannot stress this enough. You can make a huge difference for as little as $10 a month. So head on over to tmstpod.com right now. Tell Me Something True is engineered and mixed by Paul Chufo. Michael Elsesser and I dreamed up this show and we're looking forward to joining you online and next time at Tell Me Something True.